Now, Libwack talks about this, but Libwack represents an excellent book, but there's a certain undercurrent of it, of this post-revisionism, where he seems to feel that sort of everybody is against these poor former slaves, and the Freedmen's Bureau is representing the interests of the planters, basically. They're hand in glove with the planters. So my view is that actually, as I said, there's a three-way conflict here. The Freedmen's Bureau is not the agent of the former slaves, nor is it the agent of the planters. It is the agent of the free labor ideology of the North. The job of the Freedmen's Bureau is to impose a free labor system from the, on the ashes of slavery. To the extent that this means putting blacks back to work on the plantations, it does mean they have a community of interest with owners. But on the other hand, they try to defend the free labor rights of the, of the former slaves, i.e. reasonable wages, mobility, the right to leave your job. What labor is, nobody puts you in jail in the North if you leave your job. You can go get another job. Nobody sues you if you leave your job. That's what should be, in the, there should be a labor market, a free labor market. That, and with a shortage of labor, if there really is a free labor market, blacks should be able to benefit from it. The demand is greater than the supply. So if the Southern law is, is, are attempting to re regulate this labor market to avoid that, that kind of situation. Now the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, as I've mentioned briefly, was established at the very end of the Civil War to oversee the transition from slavery to freedom. It had enormous obligations. It dealt with labor, it dealt with violence, it dealt with poverty, it dealt with welfare, it dealt with legal problems, it set up its own courts, it set up schools. All this was done by, at a maximum, 900 Freedmen's Bureau agents scattered around the South. It was a remarkable institution given 19th century concepts of governmental action, but it was never remotely large enough to really, in, to really accomplish all the things that it had been um, asked to do. Nonetheless, they did do a lot of things. By the end, the Freedmen's Bureau ends in 1870. By that time, there were well over a quarter of a million students in Freedmen's Bureau schools in the South. There were hospitals having been set up. They had arbitrated numerous disputes between employer and employee. They had given out food to starving people, tried to protect blacks against violence, very hard to do that. Um, and um, as I say, uh, they, were, they were the agent of, of, of this free labor idea uh, in a situation where free labor was very difficult to actually put into effect, at least in the way it operated in the, in the North. Um, so the Freedmen's Bureau really reflects this Lincolnian idea that the way to make people work is to give them positive incentives. So they tried to make these contracts f f as fair as possible under the situation. As I mentioned weeks ago, this was the northern economic critique of slavery, which dates all the way back to Adam Smith, that slave labor is inherently inefficient because the worker has no incentive to work effectively. The worker does not benefit from his or her labor and therefore has no incentive. Give them an incentive. Free labor gives you the incentive, therefore they will work better, therefore free labor is more effective than slave. This is not a economic, I mean, this is not a statistical argument, it's an ideological argument that free labor should be and always must be better than slave. And sometimes, but it may not be true. Slave, the, there's tremendous economies of scale, on plantations which benefit slave labor. The ability to force people to work is, uh, can also lead to pretty good productivity. Um, but the notion that you could actually get people to work without compulsion was, was unknown. I mean, one planter, when the Freedmen's Bureau told, um, uh, uh, there's an account in there of, of an exchange with a planter about contracts which the Freedmen's Bureau was invalidating because they were unfair. Uh, and. Uh, the agent said, you know, in the North, workers are not required to sign yearly labor contracts, and they are not, uh, put, they are not subject to vagrancy laws if they don't, uh, if they don't uh, uh, sign, you know, have a job. Um, and the planter was incredulous. He said, well, how can you get work out of a man unless you compel him? 
How can you get work out of a man unless you compel him? That's the plantation concept. Um, and um, so, and then one other point here, and we'll get to this also, is that this period of 1865 to 66 is also a period of the beginnings of black politics in the South. Conventions, meetings, statewide, local, in which people are putting forward demands for equal rights, civil rights, political rights, economic rights. Many of those conventions pass resolutions praising the Freedmen's Bureau, requesting the Freedmen's Bureau stay. Blacks did not see the Bureau as an oppressive agent in general. Some, some of the local officials were. They saw it as an alternative source of authority, of power in the South, given that the planters still controlled most of the land. Um, so as I said, African Americans, they wanted land, Throughout this whole period, this question of 40 acres and a mule was on the agenda, but never achieved. We know that. I, I don't believe that 40 acres of land would have been an economic panacea. This would not have solved all the problems of either the former slaves or the South as a whole. Many historians think this is it. This is the key. This is the crux. If only they had distributed land, Reconstruction would have succeeded. Obviously, it's a lot better to own land than not to own land in an agricultural society. But, you know, in the 30 years after the Civil War, the small farmer faced a dire situation in the United States and everywhere else in the world. The, the, the terms of trade were shifting globally more and more toward industry and against agriculture. Uh, there was an overproduction of cotton. Um, land is not the only scarce resource in an agricultural society. The credit system, access to tools and machinery and other things. Uh, in other words, white farmers, and we will see this down the road, white farmers who mostly owned their own land before the war are losing their land in large numbers in the 30 years after the Civil War. This will eventually culminate in the populist uprising of the 1890s, where farmers are demanding major changes in the economic system to get themselves out of the um, tenancy and poverty that they've been thrust into. So small farming was an increasingly difficult mode of life, and African-American farmers would have faced similar challenges to everybody else. Uh, we can go into this in the future. I'm not saying it wouldn't have been a good idea to distribute land, but this was not the whole problem. My point is the struggle was both economic and political at the same time, which is actually why I won't go this far. A lot of Southern planters were actually more alarmed by the prospect of blacks voting than getting a little piece of land. It was the right to vote that they most vigorously opposed. Because, um, as I say, this, the struggle between the planter and the former slave, the struggle that the petitioners said, this is the all our all-time enemies, um, is fought out on the ground. It's also fought out in the realm of politics. The refusal of the white South in 1865 to accept the reality of emancipation, given a free hand by Andrew Johnson, the leaders of the white South prove that they cannot accept the reality of the end of slavery. But that refusal triggers two big reactions. One is a wave of, self, of political organization among blacks, and then a outrage in the North and a determination to intervene directly to make sure that the results of the Civil War are not being overridden you know, or reversed by the actions of these Southern governments. It seems that the Civil War is being reversed, and whatever your political view in the North, you are not going to stand around and let the South reinstitute a form of slavery. So the Black Codes, which later on, most Southern leaders say that was a tremendous mistake, a tremendous mistake to try to use the power of the state to reimpose a kind of unfree labor. Um, 
triggers one of the most titanic political battles in American history. And it's, it's a battle that rewrites the Constitution, rewrites our laws, and leads to one of the most remarkable experiments in democracy in American history. And next week, we will turn from this to Washington to see that titanic battle over Reconstruction. So that's where we'll pick up next week. <laughs>